There's Eric. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. We were awesome. just discussing you. <laughs> Sorry for being a bit tardy. I apologize. You're actually great on time. <laughs> There's no problem. All right. Um, well, so we're at 901 and it looks like people are drifting in. So I might as well, I think I'll go ahead and get us started to try to model um, staying on time. Um, so welcome to Prison Symphonies, Demolitions, Pamphlets, 20th Century Responses to Deindustrialization and Rusting Steel Belt Cities. Uh, I'm Tracy Newman. I uh, teach history at Wayne State University in Detroit, uh, and I am really thrilled to be able to be here for this panel today, um, not only because, you know, these are sort of up and coming scholars who are all doing really interesting work, most of which I've been following on Twitter, <laughs> if not elsewhere, right, or in your, in your published work. So I'm delighted that I get to sit here and listen to you talk about what you've been working on most recently. Um, but I think we, we're gonna have some excellent papers on really important topics. Um, so I'm gonna start off, I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce everyone uh, up front, and then uh, we'll have you guys present in the order I introduce you. Um, and we should have a, a plenty of time for a Q&A. I'm not, I don't have a uh, any sort of formal comment prepared, although I am sure I will have plenty of questions and things to say, and I will try to keep myself quiet and let the audience have first stab at you after. Uh, so Eric Michael Rhodes is from Akron, Ohio. He's a research fellow at both the Center for History and Culture of the Upper Texas Gulf Coast at Lamar University. Sorry, I cannot read today. At Concordia University's Deindustrialization and the Politics of Our Time Initiative. At Lamar, he is writing an article exploring the effects of deunionization on worsening petrochemical pollution during the 1980s in Beaumont, Port, Port Arthur, Texas. And at Concordia, he is writing a historiography of French deindustrialization, which will appear in a University of Toronto Press collection next year. Um, that is exhausting to even think about doing both of those things to me right now. He's also a book reviews editor at the Metropole, which is the official blog of the Urban History Association. Um, Jacob Brueggemann is a PhD student at Johns Hopkins University, a historian of America in the 19th and early 20th centuries. He writes about intellectual, cultural, and economic history and American political development. Jacob is interested in questions about how Americans viewed economic life, inequality, and poverty in the 19th century, about the shifting boundaries of the country's economic and cultural geographies as industrialization and growth changed the landscape of 19th century America, and about the American Midwest development as a region during this period. Aside from his scholarship, uh, Jacob's an editor of the Cleveland Review of Books, and I think you are from Cleveland, is this true? Or Yes, yes, all right. You were the only one who did not include your hometown, but I think I know this from the internet <laughs> about you. All right, so Eric and Jacob will be presenting together on Cleveland. Um, you'll note the program, if, if you're looking at the program, is a bit of an error. It listed Ian Tyler Clark as Eric's co-presenter, and in fact is Jacob, and Ian, who would have presented on Milwaukee, will not be able to join us today. Um, so the second presenter will be Kenneth Elias, Ken is a PhD candidate history at Harvard University. He studies modern US history with a focus on the history of capitalism, social movements, and the carceral state in metropolitan regions. His pro proposed dissertation, From the Motor City to the Murder City, Race, the Carceral State, and the, de and the Deindustrializing City, examines the history of Detroit in the late 20th century. He is based in Boston, Mass., but has roots in Detroit and is a proud alum of Wayne State University. And I will say we are very proud of him as well. Uh, Ken will be presenting on Detroit. And then our final presenter today, last but certainly not least, is Benjamin Schaefer, an incoming American history PhD student at Yale University, studying the social, economic, and political transformations of working class communities in post-industrial America. He holds an MPhil in economic and social history from Emmanuel College, University of Cambridge, where he researched the collapse of the steel industry in Sheffield, England, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Benjamin is also a graduate of Harvard College, where he won several awards for his undergraduate research. Um, a couple of them I was not sure how to pronounce, so I am just going to say well awarded <laughs> for his for his thesis and other work at Harvard. And Ben is a native of, is it Ben? Do, do you go by Ben? Sorry, I'm just shortening your name to, okay. Ben is a native of Buffalo, New York, uh, and he'll be presenting on Pittsburgh today. So um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Eric and Jacob uh, for the first for the first paper and mute myself here. Here. Great. So um, Eric and I decided to proceed, sort of dividing the um, presentation in half, roughly five to six minutes each. Um, we'll be presenting on a book chapter we have uh, under review or, or forthcoming with this collection, um, Where East Meets Midwest, uh, Exploring an American Regional Divide, edited by John Locke and Gleaves Whitney, um, who are, you know, 
Midwest History Association adjacent um, leaders in their own right. And uh, we began that chapter as sort of a proposal several years ago, um, or not several years ago, it feel, although it feels that way. Uh, certainly, in terms of thinking about where Cleveland fits in the country's cultural geography and trying to use that chapter as a way to think about the orchestra. Um, as we began to write that over the pandemic summer um, and you know, having our da databases and sources limited, we sort of expand a little bit um, our, our scope. So, so I'm gonna start um, just giving a little bit of an overview of the, the chapter and then I'll hand it off to Eric. So you know, first and foremost, thanks to Dr. Newman for chairing, thanks to the, these co-panelists. Um, and thanks to Eric for getting us together on this uh, call in the first place, it's, it's, it's very fun. So I'll, I'll continue where I sort of left off there. You know, our original concerns were about the Cleveland Orchestra as a node in this sort of East-West cultural geography or cultural imaginary, right? Um, we are thinking about, you know, how Clevelanders, Northeast Ohio and the Midwest um, understood these high, so-called high cultural institutions within that geography. Um, and you know how those perceptions changed over time as the city grew in its cultural prestige and population and then declined in, in the 70s where we cut this off. Um, the sources we were looking at and writing sort of pushed us to consider you know, a little bit out of that cultural geography framework and thinking more intensely about the continuity across the long 20th century in elite Clevelanders growth strategies and their reputation building mechanisms, right? So thinking about how the culture, the sort of high cultural institutions fit into that, which I think we both perceived as sort of something that isn't necessarily in this, this literature anymore. I think since the, the 90s, maybe, there's people have moved away from museums in, in orchestras and so on and so forth. And I think this chapter is, you know, playing with let's say the, you know, the Cleveland Orchestra in some, some interesting ways. So um, we conclude the chapter, I'll, you know, pull this out. By, by 1970, no longer was Cleveland the best location of the nation, one of its slogans. It was a place where Brewster's proclaimed that the best things are like, the best things in life are here, including this world renowned orchestra, right? So, so what we're doing in the chapter is tracing how those perceptions changed. Um, I'll go into some of the specifics there. Um, so we begin like it's a 6,000 word chapter. So there's, it's, it's relatively short and we move relatively quickly in the first half. Eric will close us off in sort of the later part of the chronology there, but we begin in, in the early or the sort of mid to late 19th century thinking about how Cleveland's boosters saw themselves sort of like historians like Burke Aaron Hinsdale, industrialists as part of that culture, cultural geography and how they, you know, drew on perceptions of Cleveland as a place in Frederick Jackson Turner's phrase, you know, reviled man that he is as a place of Yankee stock and, and use these perceptions of the Western reserve in particular to position Cleveland in a, in a privileged place in that cultural geography. Um, again, we move pretty quickly to just try to establish how Clevelanders were thinking about and through that cultural geography before issues to decline became a thing. Um, and, and that really scales up before World War One and after World War One, so right around 1920s, the orchestra is founded. It be, sort of becomes a jewel of Clevelanders' self-perception um, in that cultural geography. It's what they see themselves as sort of like offering both the, the elites, both the community, and you know, this is all, all can be you know and is problematized in the chapter. But again, this is sort of a quick and quick and dirty overview, right? Um, and after the orchestra is founded in 1918. Um, you see both the conductors, the elites involved, like John Long Severance, you know, a, a, a Standard Oil um, financier, right? Uh, using this as a way to sort of argue for Cleveland as a location people ought to move to and live in, investment ought to come to, so on and so forth. Um, this only increases through the 1930s after the hall is born, after the hall is built, Severance Hall, which still stands, was probably the most, we don't know exactly, but we, very um, probably the most expensive symphony hall. Also, Eric, I saw you just, okay, here we go. Yeah, perfect. Um, and, and sort of you see through the, you know, interwar period, 
increasing prestige. Cleveland's going on tours. They have broadcasting contract contracts with places like NBC um, and and papers ranging from the New York Times to the Washington Evening, Evening Star, you know, papers on the West Coast and international presses are really sort of heaping praise on the orchestra in a way that the boosters obviously love. Um, this kind of reaches a crescendo, if you will, in, in the post in the post war period in 1947, where the sort of meat of, of our, I think our intervention is. Um, and that's when George Sell, a former uh, director at the Met takes over and really shocks um, Cleveland to the next level. Um, people who love class or listen to classical music are probably familiar with the big five as a concept that um, comes about in the late forties. And that is Cleveland, Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, and um, uh, New York. And, and the, the, this sort of idea of the country's five best orchestras, again, was something that was a product of this intentional sort of overlap between a musical institution producing, you know, musical programs and that institution's inflection with the sort of booster ethos, let's bring people to Cleveland, let's make Cleveland sort of um, more powerful and prominent on the on a cultural geography. And, you know, Eric's gonna take us off in the mid sixties, but just briefly, I mean, Cell brought the orchestra even to the big three. So with Chicago and New York um, in the early sixties, Cleveland, you know, surpassed places like Boston and Philadelphia. George Cell was on uh, Times cover in 1963. Um, you had a huge recognition of the, the the musical excellence here that was you know latched onto by people in the by the city's elites in a way that you know they used in the same way. And then in 1965, um, another cr crucial moment, uh, sort of and this is where Eric will pick up. I think um, the U.S. State Department sent Cleveland on a, a cultural ambassadorship mission to the USSR. Um, we cut this from the final chapter, but you had like State Department agents describing the, the Cleveland Orchestra at that point as as American as apple pie, you know, so much so that the State Department helped fund this tour through Russia. And so really, you know, there's a in the chapter sort of first third first half is charting how Clevelanders were trying to, you know, work through this sort of reputational anxiety. Karen Alquist calls it, you know, this reputation building complex Midwesterners have. People like John Tiford talk about this too, but basically trying to compete interregionally and, and nationally in that cultural geography. And that is Eric's gonna show um, and, and draw out from the later parts of our chapter persists into the seventies. And is something that, that boosters in a way that, you know, again, I think we both thought is sort of lacking maybe in, this, in the literature, like these high cultural institutions were essential components of the sort of, elite consciousness about the climb. And, and in Cleveland, at least, the, the orchestra became like, and this is heavily classed, right? I mean, the music itself is racialized, but, you know, and it's, it's pro it needs to be problematized in different ways that, you know, we did a little bit, but can't do in the chapter. You know, these, these institutions became like stakes upon which the elite, you know, said, let's, let's rebuild the city or the city is still surviving. Um, and so I'll pass off to Eric there, but that's, a I think, a Think within five or six minutes overview of the, the first uh, bit of the chapter there. Um, thanks, everybody, and I'll look forward to some questions. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? All right. Tracy, thank you so much for chairing our um, discussion today. Uh, really admire your work and uh, appreciate the time you took. Um, uh, thanks to, to, uh, to Kenneth and to, uh, and to Ben. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Jacob's been describing um, the way in which, right, boosters, um, you want to call it the, the growth coalition of Cleveland, really worked hard in the first half of the 20th century to transmute industrial capital that they had been uh, sort of um, growing, right, in the region, thanks to manufacturing trying to transmute that into cultural capital by bankrolling the rise of the Cleveland Orchestra into uh, international renown. Um, and I'd like to focus now on the ways in which um, the post-war growth coalition, um, when faced with accelerating deindustrialization, especially during the 60s, uh, began to use the standing of the Cleveland Orchestra to pivot away from an industrial regional economy 
towards a post-industrial one based on retaining uh, Greater Cleveland's uh, many white collar headquarters and employees. And to put it another way, uh, City Fathers through the uh, Cleveland Musical Arts Association, which was the mouthpiece of industrialists and really the coordinating committee for the orchestra, um, uh, how they used the industrial capital that they have developed uh, in order to, to create um, in the Cleveland Orchestra a cultural amenity that would have been attractive to metropolitan Cleveland's well-to-do. Um, and this was really to retain the white collar employee base, uh, we think, uh, in the region in an, uh, in an era when you know, the manufacturing base was really collapsing. Something interesting, by the way, that we found was that it was really in the 1930s during the Great Depression that deindustrialization began um, in, in Cleveland, um, which I think is useful to think about. Um, but um, we find uh, that, um, right, the Cleveland Orchestra, if you can look, look at the map here at the area in which it's situated, University Circle, is really one of these important cultural amenities um, to Cleveland. And of course, J. Mark Souther, right, has, um, or Souther, I'm, I will only know him from Twitter as well. Um, but in his Believing in Cleveland, he, he covers this story a bit. Um, the centerpiece of the post-industrial Cleveland was really to be this neighborhood, University Circle, um, on the, the eastern uh, side of Cleveland. And this was home to Severance Hall, right, which is the home of the Cleveland Orchestra, built in 1931. Uh, Western Reserve University, soon to be Case Western, uh, the Museum of Art, and uh, interestingly too, right, the university hospital system. Um, and this was, as Souther says, um, to be the cultural hub that would stave off, quote, um, deindustrialization, rebrand Cleveland, and reverse or at least arrest the spread of what city leaders referred to as urban decay. Um, and this was really to be a brain workers city within a city. And um, so I, I always think about Cambridge, Kenneth, um, when we think about University Circle. In fact, they brought architects from Cambridge to University Circle in the 60s to kind of um, um, uh, to transform the area into something that looked more like the surroundings of Harvard University. Um, so I think the takeaway here is that during this period, specific neighborhoods um, in many steel belt cities were developed to serve as hubs of the so-called knowledge economy, right? And high culture, we are arguing, was one important part of this mix to retain these workers. Um, let me see if I can share now a little map that I made um, of metropolitan Cleveland. Yeah, here it is. Um, so, University Circle, of course, was just one important node in the larger map of Greater Cleveland, which was expanding at this time during the 1960s. Um, many of the uh, knowledge workers, right, so-called, um, that lived in Cleveland, lived in the suburbs, actually, places like University Heights, um, uh, Beechwood, uh, all of these sort of uh, leafy suburbs. Um, so it's important to understand that within Steel Belt planning circles, as the central city suffered deindustrialization, capital flight, population loss, there was really a shift towards um, building cultural amenities closer to the target audience during the post-war, namely white collar suburbanites. And we can see this by looking at this map here um, of where, um, sorry about that, of uh, where these cultural amenities were located and when they were built, right? We have Severance Hall, um, which is actually 1931, uh, built in University Circle, um, but with massive suburbanization, perhaps it's generous to call SeaWorld Ohio a cultural amenity, but I think it is one. Uh, in the 1970s uh, there, SeaWorld is uh, built in the suburbs. The Cuyahoga Valley National Park is established as kind of a tourist destination in the 1970s. Um, the Richfield Coliseum, right, uh, becomes the home of the Cleveland Cavaliers, which is in the suburbs, um, paving the way for Kenneth's uh, Pistons, right, who, who moved to Auburn Hills outside of the city in the 1980s. Um, 
And the point is here that the Cleveland Orchestra also goes to the suburbs in the, in the late 1960s. They establish Blossom Music Center uh, in the National Park, in Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Um, they established their summer home there in the 60s. Um, and this was really a bid by the business elite to compete with Boston's Tanglewood, right, out in Western Mass, Chicago Symphonies, uh, Ravinia, right, in suburban Chicago, and to um, uh, just to show, the, you know, that they were culturally hip to what was going on. The uh, musical association, this sort of the booster uh, wing of the Cleveland Orchestra, hires a Louis Kahn protege, uh, Dutchman um, Peter Van Dyck to design this ultra modern summer outdoor uh, venue. Um, so I think another important takeaway here is that during deindustrialization and the rise of the service and entertainment economy and the shift away from manu the manufacturing economy, capital accrued at the edge of these steel built cities rather than um, at their centers in many cases. Um, and I think the sort of, I'll, I'll end up here, I'll, I'll end here. Um, what's really important, the, the shift that we see uh, during um, you know, the, the 20th century here, uh, we end in the 1970s. Um, Souther talks about how Cleveland, right? Jacob mentioned this, um, their tagline uh, in all of their literature, the booster literature was in the 1950s, we are the best location in the nation. And this has to do with the centrality geographically of Cleveland. It's close to Detroit, um, it's close to Chicago, it's halfway in between New York and Chicago, right? If you wanna build things, it's the best place to do it. Lots of easy shipping, right? Um, so it's the best location in the nation. But by the 1970s, plastered on views of the uh, University Circle District, we start to see it is the best, uh, uh, it is that in Cleveland, the best things in life are here including a world-renowned orchestra. And here's where we can see the shift uh, between the manufacturing economy and the post-industrial one um, that has affected, I think, also Detroit, uh, and, as well as Pittsburgh, of course, as our, um, as our friends will tell us. And we'll end there. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Uh, and we will turn it over next to Ken. Awesome, awesome. That was awesome, Jacob and Eric. I thought that was really interesting. We just want to go visit Cleveland. Um, so thank you for that. And thank you, Tracy. And thank you to all the organizers and everybody who showed up to this panel today. I know it's early, so it's really awesome to see this big turnout. I'm going to share my screen so I could play the little slide that I've made. Uh, share. Let's see if that works. OK. Can you guys see that? Awesome. Okay. I'm going to set a timer. Um, okay, cool. So um, yeah, basically today I'll be presenting my little project, the beginnings of what I hope to be either a, a dissertation chapter or a, or a larger uh, or, or an article. Um, we'll see what happens and how far I get to it. But Pole Town, deindustrialization, reindustrialization, and neoliberal urbanism in Detroit, 1979 to um, 1982. <clears throat> a slightly different title than uh, what it says on the program. Um, but let me just introduce myself. Tracy said, you know, I'm, I'm a rising third year PhD candidate at Harvard University. Um, and my dissertation broadly focuses on, you know, this big question I am asking, which is basically like, how did black mayors and black political coalitions during the late 20th century uh, respond to the upheavals of the urban crisis? And so I'm thinking a lot about questions relating to, neo to neoliberalism, um, market-oriented urban policy. I'm thinking about questions about the carceral state and police reform, community policing especially. Um, and I'm also interested in questions about sort of like grassroots uh, community politics too. Um, you know, places like Detroit, uh, Cleveland and other sort of um, deindustrializing and shrinking uh, cri uh, cities in, in crisis, um, 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 what emerged out of them was a, a very uh, a, a loosely connected and sort of broadly built community uh, movement. A lot of community organizations um, as, as, as people in, in, in neighborhoods, um, you know, were, were, were facing the reality of austerity and social service shrinkages um, and you know, start to sort of take things into their own hands. So that's how I'm kind of thinking about this. And so I'll just start with this paper, uh, which is about the case of the uh, demolition of the Pole Town East neighborhood in Detroit and the construction of GM's plant that is now there, the Detroit Hamtramck Assembly Plant. 
Uh, so in July 1980, General Motors presented a plan to the city of Detroit to condemn and demolish over 435 acres of the Pole Town East neighborhood in Detroit to construct a new assembly plant in exchange for hundreds of millions of dollars in city and state support. In total, 1,176 buildings would be demolished and 3,438 residents relocated. Uh, the project was part of Mayor Coleman Young's grand plan to address Detroit's ailing economy. The city at this point had lost thousands of taxpaying residents and thousands of firms, uh, or hundreds of thousands of taxpaying residents and thousands of firms. Um, so by 1980, in the middle of the early 1980s recession, after decades of deindustrialization, the unemployment rate in the city was nearing 30% and was much higher for African Americans, especially between the ages of 18 and 24. So young people, especially. Uh, so as Chrysler, the city's largest employer, a uh, second largest employer, teetered on the bank of bankruptcy in 1979, it closed down its famous Dodge main plant. 3,000 workers and $3 million in tax revenue were on the chopping block. Uh, Coleman Young, in partnership with GM's chairman, Thomas Murphy, promised the, the Central Industrial Park, as it came to be called, uh, would create nearly 6,000 unionized jobs, uh, millions in tax revenue, and spur other projects around Detroit. City officials and their supporters applauded Young's efforts to retain industrial employment in a period of dramatic deindustrialization. Many of the residents of Pole Town, however, protested what they saw as the corporate filtering of their community and the public coffers in exchange for what they saw uh, and argued was an unreliable promise of jobs and tax revenue. So what began as a small but vocal group, uh, especially, uh, eventually snowballed into a metropolitan-wide movement that involved protests and occupation of a church and the attention of national political figures like Ralph Nader and Jesse Jackson. While ultimately unsuccessful, the activists casted a bright spotlight on the market-oriented urban policy and post-industrial alliance of corporations, community leaders, and city officials in the city. Um, their efforts reveal the contested politics of the newly forming neoliberal urbanism of the late 20th century. And so before I move on, let me just provide a sort of definition of that fraught and contested term neoliberalism. Um, I think that Andrew Diamond and Thomas LeGru's edit collection, Neoliberal Cities, has a really good working definition, especially for urbanists. Um, they uh, define neoliberalism as uh, the proliferation and normalization of principles, policies, and modes of governance favoring free market solutions to a range of social, political, and economic problems facing metropolitan society, with the state playing a key role in creating the institutional frameworks necessary. Um, and I also appreciate the work of urban geographers David J. Roberts and Manel uh, Matani, who are also quoted in the collection, they argue that neoliberalism also modifies the way race experience or understood in society. So this is how I'm kind of approaching thinking about Pole Town and my broader project in the future. Um, so Pole Town is one of three developments in Detroit that I'm examining uh, that's part of this larger project that I'm working on. It sort of looks at the institutionalization of black power during a period of urban crisis and right wing ascendancy and how that led to a dramatic reconfiguration of urban spaces to accommodate capital investment. Um, so my major question I think I'm asking, one of the major questions I'm asking in this project in my dissertation generally um, is how do black political leaders in shrinking and deindustrializing cities respond to the upheavals of the urban crisis? Um, so while I'm still in the early stages, it's become clear to me that there's a really important connection uh, between market-oriented urban policy, post-industrialism, and Black politics. Um, and I think this connection has been explored by a couple people, um, but it still needs to be explored further because majority Black cities were and still are uh, laboratories for deregulation, um, uh, austerity, privatization, and other policies and programs geared towards creating um, supposedly ideal conditions for capital investment. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, post-industrial development and Black politics uh, under Coleman Young, the origins of this project. So the sort of origins of Young's plans for reindustrialization and redevelopment in general uh, originate in the immediate aftermath of the 1967 rebellion. So the smoke still lingered over the rubble of uh, destroyed buildings. The city's business elite, along with the prominent institutional community leaders, formed two major nonprofits, Detroit Renaissance and New Detroit. Uh, these nonprofits reflect the powerful private public partnerships that dominated urban policy and development uh, during the late 20th century. Um, so while New Detroit focused primarily on community relations, helping to, among other things, pioneer community policing practices, Detroit Renaissance gave the CEOs of virtually every major corporation in the metro area a platform from which to advocate for their own interests uh, and their own vision of what the city looks like. So kind of similar to what Jacob and Eric were talking about um, with that arts organization. Um, and then, of course, Tracy uh, also looks at this in, in her book and many other people do. Um, so these organizations form the base of Coleman's Young's economic policy for the city of Detroit. 
So while downtown and riverfront development, expanding the fire economy and service sector economy, um, and uh, sort of promoting middle class uh, housing uh, and employment in the city was a priority. Industrial redevelopment, mostly aimed at retaining industrial employment in the city, was also a goal. In a 1975 document moving Detroit forward, Young's administration laid out their goals, and Young himself actually remarked that it didn't really matter how many jobs these reindustrialization projects produce, but the city, as long as the city did something to retain its lifeline, the declining auto industry. Um, that would be a, a major uh, facet of his economic program. Um, so Poultown uh, was, a, was a, a very old neighborhood in Detroit, originating um, back to the 1880s. Uh, it was composed of mostly cheap two-story frame houses. It was a historically working class Polish neighborhood. Um, you could argue that Poultown kind of embodied the sort of arch-typical New Deal coalition neighborhood uh, in the post-30s with its residents participating in the labor struggles of the 1930s, voting for FDR, becoming newly hyphenated Polish Americans, um, and experiencing sort of the early onslaught of deindustrialization, the flight of capital and population during the period of urban renewal and suburbanization, um, but also engaged in anti-Black violence during the 1943 Detroit riot, um, and attempted to ensure their communities stay Polish and white during the 50s and 60s. Uh, and also very, uh, the residents also had a very strong uh, Catholic identity, um, so sort of the parishes and parochial schools kind of form this territory. Um, so there's a really good book called Parish Boundaries that kind of examines that. Um, and the dozen or so churches whose steeples dot the skyline demonstrate this too. Um, by the 1980s, because of urban renewal and white flight, um, the city actually became one of the most integrated neighborhoods in the city. But this integration was relatively um, uneven and unequal. The majority of white residents owned their homes, while Blacks and Arab Americans who lived in the neighborhood actually rented. Um, and so like most neighborhoods in the city during the 1980s, it suffered from high unemployment, uh, an aging population, crime and poverty, uh, deteriorating housing stock, um, and various other sort of ills of the, of the late 20th century city. Um, but according to oral histories and reports from the period, um, many residents felt a degree of solidarity with their neighbors. And prominent community institutions and businesses like the churches, restaurants, and bars anchored the social relations of pulled out. So it was declining, but it was far from dead. Um, so un unlike the way the GM in the city described it, which was a, a desolate, empty neighborhood, um, it actually had, you know, a very, a, a relatively very strong um, um, community that was anchored by these institutions, and especially anchored by the, the fact that many of these residents, especially the white Polish residents, um, uh, sort of lived in the city for, for decades, basically, and had, had these very intimate ties, especially to their churches, too. Uh, and this has a lot to do with sort of Catholic identity. So I think there's a big religious history side of this too that I kind of want to explore in the future. Um, okay, uh, so city officials boasted that GM's investment would yield millions in property taxes and employ workers whose wages would be subject to the city's income tax. Um, GM's construction in Detroit was also viewed as a sort of case study or as viewed as a sort of test case, uh, which they hoped that they could use to demonstrate to other companies that Detroit knew how to do business. Uh, the UAW backed the project, and so did the Catholic Archdiocese, uh, who actually stood to lose several parishes and historic churches. Um, so when Dodge Main was torn down, um, originally uh, uh, the, the Wayne County government, which is where Detroit is located, uh, contracted a Washington firm to determine what to do with the site. Uh, one idea was that they could turn the, act the old factory into a state prison, which would then house 500 people who would then be contracted out to the auto companies. Now, of course, this never happened, but you can kind of see the kind of really wonky and crazy ideas that were being sort of formulated at the time in response to deindustrialization and this crisis. Um, so to accommodate GM, G uh, Detroit had to obtain uh, title to Pole Town's 1,400 homes, 144 businesses, and uh, 16 churches. So taking this much property would be uh, one of the most massive and rapid re relocations of citizens for a private development project in U.S. history up to that point. So the city had to pay basically these property owners their market value plus relocation costs, bulldoze buildings, remove toxic waste. GM also demanded a 12-year, 50%, $60 million tax abatement and all necessary air, water, and waste permits and rezoning of the land. So this is a monumental project. I think it was actually larger than the project of the, uh, the Renaissance Center, which is right here, which is the which is GM's headquarters actually, not too far away from where Pole Town is. Um, so in total, it would cost about $260 million with many millions more coming from the state. So accounting for inflation from 1980, that was nearly a billion dollars. And that was a city that at the time uh, was teetering on the brink of bankruptcy, much like Chrysler was. 
Um, so this project was actually facilitated by this, um, this change in Michigan's uh, uh, uniform condemnation uh, laws. So um, these laws would authorize cities to sort of take over private property uh, to encourage development or to develop things like highways or, or um, you know, sanitation places, public services. The law uh, was changed in 1980 to authorize the taking of private property in order to encourage commercial development. Um, so commercial development and what comes out of it, taxes uh, and jobs, could be considered public use for the public service. So the city argued that a GM Cadillac plant, which was being built, uh, would serve the public. Um, the law also included a quick take, which was, which meant that the government could condemn properties instantly, um, kick out the owners, um, but allow the owners to sue later on to be sort of resolved with monetary, uh, monetary stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of running short here, but basically there's a series of lawsuits coming out of the battle for Full Town. Um, there are a lot of law articles that touch upon this because it became one of the most important eminent dom domain cases uh, in uh, recent history. Um, but the main question was Detroit's claim uh, that it would provide, uh, uh, that the plant would provide a, a sort of public service or good. Basically, as one judge argued, quote, unemployment deeply affects the lives of citizens and of the city and the state which they are resident. In a large part, how a city and a state can avoid more decline depends upon the employment of its citizens. Uh, and the emphasis on this project is not upon GM, but upon the employment and attendant revitalization of the city. So basically, they argued that you know, Poltown could be sacrificed for the public good, which were jobs and tax revenue. GM receiving hundreds of millions of dollars in public money and making enormous profit was purely incidental to the gains of the city of Detroit and the people there would um, obtain. Um, so most residents of Poltown were caught off guard about this project um, because they usually took years to start. But this one, uh, because of GM's uh, 12 month or a 10 month uh, 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 deadline for clearing out the plan and beginning construction, um, they, uh, they uh, really had to uh, start very early. Um, so public meetings were immediately called by the Pole Town Neighborhood Council, um, led by a variety of people in the neighborhood, um, um, uh, who then uh, began to start uh, shifting from lobbying uh, politicians to uh, planning more confidential demonstrations in the late in late September of 1980. So all this was happening in basically a year and a half uh, time uh, sort of time uh, time lapse. Um, so I'll just like I mean there's a lot to it. There's an occupation of a church. There's the involvement of Jesse Jackson, Ralph Nader, which is interesting. The involvement of the Great Panthers. Um, so there's a whole bunch that comes out of it. But uh, you basically should understand that you know it's this, it's this movement that uh, was created by old time residents um, and their allies in in, in Pole Town. Um, and so there's this major fragmentation of this project of this uh, resistance movement that all of the literature doesn't really address. That um, while white residents in Pole Town resisted the project. Um, the majority of Black residents there actually appreciated it and accepted it. Um, Horace L. Sheffield, who was the president of the Detroit Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, critiqued the protests against the plant, writing that, in their view, the, uh, the facility is a giant step forward, um, and they won't want it, They don't want to see it hobbled by an emotional dispute, what they call an emotional dispute that threatens to hide the, quote, critical needs for uh, more, more industrial jobs. Um, so there are a lot of reasons for why there was a, fragment a racial fragmentation in, in support for the project. Um, we can kind of talk about that in a, at a Q&A. Um, and I can also talk about the occupation of the church, the assistance of Ralph Nader and Mr. Jackson and other concentrations during their resistance. But um, so basically, um, so here's actually a, a really cool image of, of a pro-plant uh, demonstration. Jobs will keep uh, Detroit alive, import jobs, import Nader. Uh, so to end and to conclude, um, in 2018, General Motors announced their decision to close the Detroit Hamtramck assembly plant that employed 1,500 people and provided millions in tax dollars to both cities. So while GM ultimately reversed its plans after a two-month strike by the UAW, um, it is obvious now that the public-private partnerships of the 1970s and 1980s uh, would become the sort of predominant way of, uh, of the city of, of developing the city's uh, economic base. Uh, so in the past few decades, we, we see how cities and states have regularly competed for corporate investment from Amazon HQ2 HQ uh, to Foxconn in southeastern Wisconsin. In most cases, the, the benefits were small compared to the payout of public money. To understand how we got here, it's important to historicize these policies and resistance to them. I think that Pole Town marks a significant moment in the history of our cities in the Rust Belt and elsewhere responded to the urban crisis. Urban, gov urban governments began to see their mission, their economic policy, uh, as to was to uh, attract, do whatever it takes to attract capital at whatever, whatever cost. Uh, the consensus, however, was not entirely stable as residents yesterday and today have contested these plans and advocated for a different, more just vision of urban redevelopment. Thank you.
Great, thank you, Ken. I see the, the clapping hand uh, emojis. Are they emojis in Zoom? Well, whatever they are in Zoom. Um, and so thanks. And then we will turn things over to Ben. Um, I will maybe ask a couple questions after he speaks and then we'll, we'll go straight to the audience. Great, well, uh, thank you so much, Tracy and uh, Jacob and Eric and, and Ken. Thanks for, for, for joining me this morning and good morning to everyone from, from Buffalo, New York. Um, I want to start by just thanking the Midwestern History Association and the Howenstein Center for organizing this conference. Um, you know, the, the past 15 months have been incredibly challenging in so many ways for all of us. Um, and it's it's a real testament to the work of, of everyone who organized that we have two incredible days of, of programming to, to celebrate uh, Midwestern history and scholarship. So, so thank you. Um, and I also want to thank our chair, Tracy Newman, and my fellow panelists for convening what I hope actually becomes a longstanding conversation about the many meanings of deindustrialization and how we historians interpret and write about it. So I'm going to talk to you all today about a small but determined community of Pittsburgh steel workers who from 1979 to 1987 actively captured their own experience of the collapse of their city's longstanding economic foundation through a community newspaper called the Mill Hunk Herald. To do so, I wanna begin by inviting you into their milieu with a story from one of the places they called home, Wobbly Joe's Bar on Pittsburgh's South Side. It was deep midwinter 1981 and the community gathered at Wobbly Joe's to listen to long-haired Connecticut singer, Charlie King. King was no stranger to Pittsburgh, but his recent success in Nashville heightened the stardom that attended the folk singer as he approached the microphone. Surveying the crowd from the stage, King greeted familiar faces and instructed new ones that audience participation at his concerts was not only encouraged, but mandatory. Kicking off the show, King announced to his audience, this is day 29 of the Reagan crisis. 200 million people are still being held hostage. Glasses and bottles rose to concur with King's sentiments, and even the bartender stopped pouring beers momentarily to show her solidarity. As King played through his set list, rounds of singing and laughter accompanied the many drinks passed across the bar that night. But the regulars in the audience knew not to drink so heavily as to miss King's lyrics and stories, which were for and about people like them. Of the many songs he played that cold Pittsburgh night, the crowd most heartily joined in the chorus of one of King's then most popular tunes, calling back and forth to one another, our life is more than our work and our work is more than our job. Their collective repetition, one could imagine, must have been a bomb in a city where jobs had begun to rapidly disappear and the meaning of work and life itself was hardly certain. Like dozens of other industrial cities in America and Western Europe, Pittsburgh's industrial might disintegrated after the 1960s. From 1979 to 1987, 150,000 manufacturing jobs in Pittsburgh disappeared uprooting the livelihoods of working class families dependent on manufacturing and dealing a fatal blow to the industry which brought the city to international prominence. These layoffs represented a nearly 50% reduction in manufacturing jobs in Pittsburgh between 1980 and 1986, an especially striking drop compared to a national 6% reduction over the same period. In Pittsburgh, this collapse occurred at the same time as local political and business elites what you know, my colleagues have called growth coalitions, worked to reframe and rebuild Pittsburgh's national image as a high-tech headquarters town, not a rusty vestige of industrial yesteryear. Successive efforts at urban renewal dubbed by local elites, the Pittsburgh Renaissance and Renaissance II, attempted to write steel out of the city's past, present, and future. Skyscrapers, cultural districts, business parks, and shopping centers were the staples of these renaissances, which sought to, attra to attract a new professional middle class to the city, often at the expense of Pittsburgh's longtime residents, especially its working class communities like those that gathered at Wobbly Joe's. In print from February 1979 to the summer of 1988, the Mill Hunk Herald's publishing Lifetime was contemporaneous with this critical period of industrial economic and urban transformation in the greater Pittsburgh area, 
And more than most other arch archival remnants from the era, the Herald's 20 issues reflect the voices, concerns, and often limited hopes of the people and communities that kept Pittsburgh's steel engine running for generations as they contended in real time with collapse all around them. The Herald was a diverse amalgamation of nonfiction and fiction, opinion and poetry, all of which came from non-paid community members and readers near and far sympathetic to its mission. Herald organizers did not edit the pieces they published, selected through a vote of the paper's subscribers and organizers, and the thousands of articles, short stories, letters, poems, cartoons, and other contributions that fill the Herald's 20 issues are therefore the direct testimony of those who submitted them. Local steelworker and frequent contributor Ron Hively and American literary superstar Kurt Vonnegut alike. My paper investigates the Herald's evolution across its 10 year lifespan as a primary outlet through which a small segment of working Pittsburghers confronted the monumental change taking place in their city and in so doing refashioned their identities in an environment increasingly devoid of work. From its early foundation as a vehicle for rank and file union organizing, through its shift toward the competing priorities of saving steel mills and transmitting testimonies of unemployment, to its final toward, turn toward community grief and memory, I argue that working Pittsburghers used the Mill Hunk Herald to capture the crash of deindustrialization on their communities to create space for community comprehension thereof, and to establish a new foundation of personal and social identity rooted in grief and memory. Setting aside historiographical considerations to which I'll return at the end, I wanna briefly highlight the important takeaways that come from my analysis of the Herald, which I argue had three distinct phases across its lifetime. In the first phase, from 1979 through the end of 1980, Herald organizers and contributors and invested substantial energy defining what the paper was. And these definitional efforts transmitted the lived realities and concerns of Pittsburgh's steelworking community as the city's industrial downfall really took flight. Amid national economic and political turmoil, the first two years of publication reflect a working Pittsburgh defined by anti-establishment dissent and working class identity politics. Writers and editors alike conveyed an overwhelmingly negative relation to established institutions wherever they found them. And that was their employers, their unions, and their government, you know, local all the way to the federal government. And they combined this anti-institutional bent with an emphatic and nativist sense of Americanism. More than 300 people contributed articles to the Herald's first two years of publication and its final edition before Ronald Reagan's election hit more than 100 newsstands in the Pittsburgh area and it was in the mailboxes of nearly 2000 subscribers. A new fervor took hold of Pittsburgh's working communities after Reagan's election and with it, a new set of priorities defined the Herald's pages from 1981 through 1983. Distrust in the federal government transformed into a seething hatred for Ronald Reagan and anyone associated with him. And contributors also sharpened their critiques of corporate America. More importantly, the Herald became a vehicle for working Pittsburghers to communicate competing priorities, saving the crumbling steel industry on the one hand and collecting worker experience on the other. Conversations about worker ownership took on new urgency and greater specificity as steel workers grasped for an alternative to joblessness and accounts of unemployment increased in frequency as hope for recovery dwindled. Herald issues from this period document a fierce struggle for voice and agency against a rising tide of business-friendly conservatism, disinvestment, and shutdown. But the end, uh, by the end of the second phase, Herald organizers had a regular readership of 7,000 in Pittsburgh, elsewhere across the country, and even abroad. And this is a clear sign of the publication's ability to powerfully capture at the local level a phenomenon that extended far beyond the Monongahela River Valley. The period from 1984 to 1988 comprises the last phase of the Herald's lifetime, in which it became a platform for the transmission of memory and culture in an effort to document the plight of working class Americans. In prose and in verse, Herald contributors dedicated their final years of writing to throwing into relief the pervasive sense of disfranchisement and forgottenness that attended former steelworking communities in Pittsburgh and, and really around the country in a community where physical labor played an outsized influence on social identity formation, the disappearance of employment presented a direct threat, not just to the pocketbooks, 
but more importantly to the identities of workers and their families. In a post-industrial Pittsburgh devoid of work, memory and testimony became the basis for working class social identity. And the Herald actively transformed into a liminal space for the documentation of economic and social disempowerment as it happened. I wanna turn finally to the historiographical implications of this paper. Placing Herald contributors at the forefront of my analysis, my, my paper marks a significant departure from existing scholarship on the collapse of Pittsburgh steel industry. Staking a claim for the importance of bottom-up social history in current and future investigations of post-industrial urban transformation. To date, most histories of Pittsburgh's collapse focus primarily on the actions of local elites who led the city through its crisis and renaissances. And for that matter, I'm actually really honored to have Tracy chairing this panel uh, because her book on Pittsburgh and Hamilton, Ontario is, is the best and certainly the most comprehensive political and business history of Pittsburgh's post-industrial period. Uh, Tracy's fantastic analysis notwithstanding though, we have until very recently heard little from Pittsburgh's working community themselves. And the same can be said of many other histories of deindustrializing communities around the country. Gabe Winant's tremendous new book, The Next Shift, which I hope many of you have, uh, is the first major work to take, take Pittsburgh's post-industrial working classes as its primary point of analysis. And I'm really excited to incorporate Gabe's arguments as I continue to revise uh, my own work. And this paper started as a, as a master's dissertation uh, last year before this book, Gabe's book came out. Um, so in closing, I would submit to you all that we have an urgently scholarly imperative uh, to include the experience of working communities in future analyses of post-industrial America. The working classes did not, as some historians would like to suggest, die off or disappear at the end of the industrial period. Many, including the one I analyzed, persisted and transformed through the collapse of everything they had come to know and founded new identities on a sense of nostalgia that has in recent years become a problematic prize of political expediency on both sides of the American political aisle. Others still joined a new, more diverse, more precarious working class in a service economy without nearly the same amount of protection and security that previous generations of workers fought, sweat, and bled for. So as our field begins writing comprehensive histories of the final years of the 20th century, we must not relegate post-industrial workers to, in, in the words of the great British labor historian E.P. Thompson, the enormous condescension of posterity. Rather, we must reaffirm the critical importance of working people to histories of the communities and larger world in which they lived. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. More clapping. Great. Um, so I'm not going to say too much. We actually have a really good audience here. Uh, I, I do want to make just a couple of quick comments. Um, for, first is that I feel sort of bad for Ben um, having to get you out. Know, you you could have gone in a bit harder on uh, how historians of Pittsburgh tend to ignore the workers. Uh, and I, I am certainly guilty of that. They're sprinkled, you know, in my work, they're sprinkled through there. Um, but I think, you know, sort of what I want to say, listening to you guys, and I, I mentioned as we were sort of chatting at the beginning. I was just in one of these deindustrialization uh, sessions. I think some of you were there as well at Concordia. There's another one coming up in a few weeks um, on sort of recent works in deindustrialization. And I think that you know it's it's really striking um, listening to like you guys are hitting all of the the major currents in that literature as it's moving forward. Um, and I think that you know the, one of the things that is that I've always found very striking about the deindustrialization literature is there is a bit of a divide. Well there are maybe three divides. There are the labor historians, there are the sort of political historians, and then there are the urban historians. And I am very firmly an urban historian, right? So I'm interested in what's what happens to the city. Um, and sometimes that leads people in in my camp, if you will, to care a little bit less about the, the people the people I'm not great like I will Ken's had me in class and I am prone to making comments about how I'm not that interested in people which isn't actually true I am but in my own research I read that so I think that you know I, I think that that was a, a, a really um, spot on critique of of the literature in general and, and all of you um, you know, you're sort of hitting on memory studies, you're hitting on neoliberalism, you're hitting on urban renewal as something we need to, that's been written about a lot, but that we need to look at differently and look for different actors as participants in and, and affected by um, this sort of conflict between working class culture and high culture, this idea about who, who are these places going to be for, 
uh, these sorts of things. So Eric's making some comments in the, the chat here um, too. Oh, that's very nice about um, uh, Ian Tyler Clark's panel. So you can take a look there on, on Milwaukee as well. Thanks, Eric, for putting that in the chat. So I think that, um, you know, in terms of where all of your work is going and the kinds of historiographical interventions you're making. Uh, I think we've been really lucky to get three papers and it sounds like a fourth fourth paper that would have would have really hit on all of these most vibrant um, emerging themes or, or so in some cases re-emerging, right? Like the first the first round of literature on deindustrialization actually was about the workers in a very um, sociological way, right? And and now uh, we're we're sort of getting past that. The same the same with urban renewal, right? We've been talking about race and urban renewal as long as we've been talking about urban renewal, um, but not really. In, in a way that, that gives uh, the same people agency or um, thinks about political power in the same ways. And same thing, you know, the, this idea of, of thinking about a cultural strategy and what that means, um, you know, that the way Eric and, and Jacob are talking about it is very different than uh, the way we might've done that if we were writing about that in the nineties, the for instance. So I just wanted to, to say that I, you know, I really admire how well you've pulled these papers together since you're, you're hitting on all of these, these topics. Um, and I won't say much else for now. We've got a half an hour left and I want to give, uh, the audience a chance to ask questions. Um, I think I can get you all. I'm trying to figure out if I can get you all on one screen, if I blow this up enough. Yeah, no, I cannot. So um, you can raise your hands if you want, uh, but I think we're a big enough group that I can't fit you all on screen, but not so big that you can't just unmute yourself to ask a question if you want to. Or if people want to ask questions or make comments in the chat, I will monitor that and, and read them out. Um, but I will kind of scroll around here and look for hands. Do we have anyone want to ask the first, first question, claim the first question? This is the part that's always awkward by Zoom. Ah, I see a hand. Where did it go? It just switched screens on me. I saw a hand. I saw a hand. Why does it keep switching screens on me? I have my hand up. OK, thanks. They, they, it seriously it just keeps jumping every time the hand raises. Go for it. <laughs> um, first, uh, all the papers were quite interesting. Thanks for your terrific panel. Um, I had a, I mean, I would have questions for everybody. I, would, I had a particular question for Kenneth uh, Alias's. Uh, um, and I, I just was curious about more to learn more about the interaction between the African American community and the uh, and the I guess um, the white community, but primarily Polish, maybe Polish American community in Pole Town. Um, because you mentioned that I think I heard that a majority of African American residents sort of were in favor of this plan. And then I think you you also mentioned, I think, a really interesting topic, um, which is the vestiges of, of 1960s black power and how that politics worked its way, which I'm really interested in, in the 70s and 80s. I know not that I know anything about it, but I, I guess I just wanted uh, to know if you could expand on, on the dynamic between those two communities and how they came together or didn't come together in this controversy. Yeah, terrific question. Um, let me just say something about the, 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 the institutionalization of black power. If you want a really good book, that I've been benefited from um, Cedric Johnson's um, Revolutionaries to Race Leaders, Black Power and the Making African American Politics. It's a really interesting book. I may have my critiques of it, but um, it's a really interesting book that talks about the sort of, you know, how, um, you know, how this sort of revolutionary Black Power uh, that sort of fomented in the late 1960s, early 70s, translated to um, political power when, when many of these, uh, these leaders and these movements uh, gained off a political office. Um, and so part of it is sort of this pragmatic response to the crisis of the, of the urban crisis, you know, how, how do we, you know, once we're in, in power, we sort of have to, um, you know, concede to all these like norms of like being in power, stuff like that. Um, what's interesting about Coleman Young particularly is that um, compared to his predecessor, who was a, a white racial liberal in the 1960s, uh, um, James Kavanaugh, he was actually like way more pro-business and way more connected towards these sort of like redevelopment policies than, than Kavanaugh was. And, you know, part of that was, I think that Kavanaugh um, had to, you know, sort of critique the business community um, for, for, for a number of reasons. But one is that he had to sort of court the um, African-American vote uh, to build the sort of coalition in, in, the, in the city that at the time was becoming majority African-American. Whereas Coleman Young, um, with his sort of community politics, and, and I, I didn't talk about him, but he has a history of being a trade unionist, uh, um, a radical, very prominent in Detroit's African-American community. He was able to sort of moderate 
the more radical and uh, you know sort of community politics elements of, of Detroit's black coalitions um, and sort of channel that into you know the programs and visions he had. Um, so there's another really interesting book. Um, by Todd C. Shaw, who's a political scientist, called Now is the Time. And it's all about how in, in Troy, Coleman Young sort of moderated um, the, the more radical elements of, 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 of community politics. But about, about Pole Town, yeah, so this is something I'm still trying to figure out. The major book that's published on Pole Town, um, Pole Town Community Betrayed by Jeanne Wiley, um, doesn't really examine the African American um, experience in Pole Town. Um, what I found is that since the majority of African American residents in Pole Town were renters, and who were actually newly migrated to the neighborhood, they didn't have the same community ties and sort of connection to, to the city, this historic identity with the, with the neighborhood um, that the elderly um, 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 Polish residents did. So, you know, part of that is kind of this like pragmatic thing where it's like, we've had to move for a very long time. The relocation benefits that the city was providing were somewhat generous. Um, and the, the, the housing in the neighborhood wasn't that, that, that um, you know, that good. So a lot of residents, you know, very pragmatically just accepted relocation and, and moved. Um, but there's also, I think that there's this sort of bigger connection, uh, connecting the sort of racial politics of Detroit to what happened in Pole Town. One of the questions a lot of Black uh, activists who were pro-plant were asking was, you know, why does this, why does this, you know, it was integrated, but, you know, basically why does this white neighborhood, described as a white neighborhood, historically white neighborhood, why does this white neighborhood matter more than uh, the black neighborhoods that were demolished, like Black Bottom specifically in Paradise Valley and all these other neighborhoods, you know? So there was this big question about memory and urban renewal. And I think it's connected to Young's larger sort of reputation, um, you know, as, as, a, as a sort of, um, you know, he has, he has his reputation as being a sort of, you know, staunchly, um, I don't know how you describe like black power mayor among the, the sort of city's whites. Um, so I, I think just to conclude, um, you know, another thing is that, uh, these poll, poll town residents, these white residents, uh, they didn't vote for Young. They voted for the white candidates who, who, who appeared uh, to, uh, to oppose Young. They saw Young as this sort of, um, you, know, sort of you know, described as flamboyantly uh, offensive. Uh, um, and like they described Young as oftentimes very racist to white residents in the city. So there's this longer history of the sort of racial politics developing today that I think needs to be connected to it. Um, I'm still trying to figure out, but it is a really important aspect of this of this project. Thanks, that's fascinating. Great, and Eric uh, Eric McDuffie, you had some comments, questions. Yes, I do. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, before I get started, I do I would like just to let everyone know um, that at 1 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon, I will be chairing a roundtable titled "Black." Midwestern History Matters, African-American Life in the U.S. Heartland and, and the Struggle for Freedom. And we very much will be taking up issues of race and the centrality of African-Americans to the Midwest. And I'd like to use that um, as a segue into uh, my comments and questions for the panel. First, let me say uh, I found the papers to be quite interesting. Um, I took uh, copious notes and thank you for the very interesting presentation. That said, I, I felt overall that uh, the papers both challenge yet at the same time often kind of reinscribe prevailing narrative of the Midwest in terms of uh, overlooking or not being explicit about the centrality of race, the centrality of African Americans into shaping the various topics that you all discussed. I appreciate it, uh, the, com the comments, I believe, uh, from Kenneth Alas. Uh, my apologies if I uh, mispronounced your name. Um, how, how, how you in the Q&A, how you went into the complexities of Colton Young's uh, uh, racial politics, his complicated pro uh, business politics. I guess I would have liked to have heard that a bit more in, um, in your paper. Um, for the paper on Pittsburgh, again, very, very interesting. But again, I, I, was, I was curious to know um, you started with a uh, vignette with an anecdote about a bar in Pittsburgh. I assume those were probably white uh, male uh, uh, Pittsburghers. And again, I was curious to know the the intersections of ra how race, class, gender, masculinities shaped their understanding of the world of deindustrialization. I imagine that many of those folks were probably um, 20, 30 years later voted for Trump. And lastly, in terms of the paper on, on Cleveland, very, very interesting. I'm from Cleveland, uh, uh, rather raised in the Cleveland area, I'm born in uh, Detroit. Uh, in terms of 
university circle, that area today has undergone in the last 40 years, undergone major gentrification and of course near Glenville, the site of the Glenville riot. So again, in some ways, both questions and comments and just a real urge for, for, for historians of, of the Midwest to be very clear and central um, or uh, clear about, the, again, the uh, centrality of race and African-Americans to uh, the shaping of these very sisters. Thank you. Go ahead, Eric, you wanna respond? Yeah, hi, Dr. McDuffie. Um, big fan of your work on you know small cities. I'm actually a um, uh, an ad an advisee of uh, Nishani Frazier's uh, at Miami. We work together, um, so I think you know her work on Cleveland, um, on Black Power in Cleveland, on the Stokes family in Cleveland, um, right, is certainly um, a, a part uh, one one area in which we could. Um, you know, expand, right? I mean, yeah, University Circle, right? It's, it's on the east side of Cleveland. It's not too far um, from these really important historical, you know, sites of uh, the, the Great Migration. Um, and I think that one thing that I've been thinking about a lot, reading another great um, new book on uh, deindustrialization, um, it, which is Hackworth's, Jason Hackworth's um, Manufacturing uh, Decline which Kenneth has, is actually gonna be reviewing for us uh, coming up here on the, at the Metropole, is one important um, aspect of the 1960s and how um, decline as a concept, right, is certainly uh, inscribed uh, racially, right? Um, so Stokes is elected in, remind me, is it 67, right? In the same way that, um, Andrew Diamond talks about in his book on Chicago, uh, the the um, the mayoral campaign um, of of, uh, of Washington in Chicago, right? And as Kenneth is describing with Coleman Young, there's certainly this this um, this linkage of loss of jobs and loss of white control, right? Which pushes SeaWorld to Aurora. Right, <laughs> which in which uh, blossom in in the park, right? You know that that's got to have. There's 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 definitely an angle there to talk about. So while our paper focused really on what these elites were were sort of thinking, um, I think we we definitely could have done more to and can do more in the future to um, to read these planning documents and to find you know what exactly was the uh, if we want to call it, you know, I mean, certainly there's urban decline that they talk about, which Hackworth is problematizing as, well, wait a second, it's just that these cities are becoming more black, right? And, um, and industrial decline, which is certainly real, although many of the plants are moving to the suburbs as they've been doing since the 1920s, you know, um, so the whites can, can keep those jobs. Um, but I think we could do more to read those planning documents and, and to un uncover what, what the role of racial threat is in all of this. So thank you so much. Huge fan of your work. Yours and, and Jim Connolly's who's here too on small cities in the Midwest. It's really excellent stuff. Thank you. Would anyone else like to respond to that? Ben. Yeah, I absolutely will. Uh, Professor McDuffie, thank, thanks very much for, for your comments. I, I totally own uh, what it is that you're saying about the limitations uh, of my focus. Um, this is that this paper began as a um, oh crap, the world just closed down dissertation, archives everywhere are shut, um, 3,500 miles across the Atlantic to my childhood bedroom. How do I, how do I salvage an academic project here? Um, and so the, my, my focus on the Herald um, which was written in Pittsburgh Southside, which was an overwhelmingly white community, um, was, was the direct result of there not being co complete digitized archives anywhere else. And I know that, you know, before, you know, as I, as I continue workshopping this paper, now that it is done and as archives reopen, there's a totally different story to be told about Pittsburgh's black community. And, and, and Tracy can, can talk about this as well as I can, um, you know, the, the South Side rusted and, and, you know, much of 
Pittsburgh's black community was demolished um, and became you know, the, the cultural hubs of, of new skyscrapers and performing arts centers and everything else. Um, and so, so I, uh, I fully own the fact that, that my focus uh, was very limited and it was you know, the unfortunate contingency of a global pandemic shutting down uh, archives that, that prevented me from being able to write a complete story of, of Pittsburgh's working classes and working communities uh, because it is, it is incredibly limited. Anyone else want to pop in? We're getting a five minute warning. Apparently I was wrong about our time. I thought we had till 1030, but we have till 1015. It seems like from the warnings we're getting. So I, I have already failed in my primary task as chair here of keeping time. Um, any any other comments or questions? I want to say, I, I just very quickly, I'll make a comment. Um, I think this is a really important, this, this issue comes up over and over and over in the literature on deindustrialization, de right? That, that this is, I mean, race has been ignored in most places, or it's it's under <laughs> underwritten about compared to other things, um, race and gender. But um, I think that in deindustrialization, this has been in sort of a nostalgic way. This has been the case, and I'm guilty of this. I think a lot of us are guilty of this. You write about this stuff um, that there's there's a, a bias in the archives towards um, white working class men because. The, the records that are heavily collected are union records or the, the records of white worker organizations. Um, and it's not to say that there aren't, aren't other records. And it's not to say that there aren't, there are plenty of people around to talk to. Um, you know, oral histories are a way to get at this. But I think that, um, that this is something, you know, uh, Eric McDuffie's points, this is something I think people, scholars are becoming more conscious of and is really, um, a really important thing to underscore with this particular literature, not just about the Midwest, but I think in general about about thinking about deindustrialization, even in in other countries, right? Um, this is this is true in France. This is true in in other places as well. So, I appreciate your responses, Eric and Ben, to this as well. Um, same with gender. Women tend to be very missing from these studies, unless it is specifically a study about women, right? Um, and then it's usually not deindustrialization literature, it's in some other literature. So anyone else want to weigh in? We've got like two minutes left. Any other comments, questions? Yeah, I mean, in lieu of other questions, something that that is that Eric and I, you know, reference, I think, in the early parts of our chapter and that I've had to deal with in doing a spin-off pandemic year article on the Cleveland Orchestra is, is this tension in cities' obsession with these high cultural institutions between like the universal exceptionalism of like, like Bach, for example, or Matisse pieces, right? And like the quality that these are, you know, that, that elites think they will have for the public and how that process itself like naturalizes a particular Eurocentric artistic heritage as you know the culture that everybody needs that the public needs and that's really true I mean in in Cleveland right Cleveland's one of the birthplaces of jazz and when the when the orchestra comes out and is founded in 1918 there's like an explicit um founding of that orchestra against sort of like popular music forms like jazz which is highly racialized I mean Cleveland's one of the few cities in fact in which in the 20s jazz was like illegal for a brief period. And, and that's just to say, you know, there, there's a lot of work to do there. And Eric and I, I think struggled cutting it down. And this is not to say like, you know, this is a reason why we couldn't do it because ideally we need to be able to talk about that. But, it, but there's a tension there and it, it shifts because by the sixties, the, the orchestra is serving, in fact, many black and brown Clevelanders through these educational programs that they had. Yet again, though, there's a tension there between the naturalized sort of, you know, Western cultural heritage and the oftentimes explicit rejection of other cultural forms. And that's something that people are dealing with left and right and something Eric, in the way Eric was referencing, like, you know, we need to account for it in the 60s and 70s. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's just to say, um, this is a little add a little context there about the, the literature on sort of the orchestra and classical music, but um, there's certainly more that can be done. All right, we just got our one minute warning, uh, or maybe we got that one minute ago. Uh, so thank you everyone. I, I really appreciate the papers. These were fantastic.
but breakout room is closing in 56 seconds. This is this is like the best conference timekeeping system ever, actually. <laughs> Um, so thanks for your thoughtful comments from the, the audience and for the great papers. I really look forward to, to seeing how your projects all develop. Um, and we'll maybe see everyone in, in sessions later today. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks, folks. Thank you, everybody.